Hi, I am going to discuss the hardware architecture of Generation 5 and 6 game consoles. This video is a continuation to the previous video covering hardware emulation for game consoles. For simplicity, I am going to only focus on the Microsoft, Nintendo, and Sony consoles. I would first like to do a high-level overview of computer system architecture, since all game consoles are computers. We start with the CPU, the part of the computer which executes code. Attached to the CPU is usually one or more levels of cache. The cache acts as a small portion of the system's main memory, which can be accessed very quickly. Originally, cache was placed on the main motherboard, however it has since been moved onto the same die as the processor. Attached to the processor through a high-speed interconnect is a north bridge. This device is responsible for interfacing with the system memory, which often requires specific control sequences. It will also connect to high-speed add-on devices such as graphics cards. The north bridge will be connected to another device called the south bridge, which is responsible for interfacing with slower speed devices, as well as internal storage and general I.O. such as USB. Both the north bridge and the south bridge are typically found in a separate package from the processor, which is known as the chipset. Notice how the processor is connected to the rest of the computer through the single high-speed interconnect. This interconnect is known as the front side bus or system bus and provides a simple address mapped interface to the processor. So, for all intents and purposes, all the processor sees is a large block of memory, which happens to be mapped to different devices by the chipset. Interestingly, modern processors are integrating the north bridge and the processor onto the same package, which allows for even higher speed communication between the processor and the main system memory. This is apparent in the processor datasheets, where the RAM lines are coming directly from the processor. In this case, the south bridge will be the only component in the chipset. One of the best examples is the Nintendo 64. Due to its elegant design, it is very easy to see the architecture layout by simply looking at the circuit board. First, we have the CPU, which is the NEC VR4300. Next, we have the chipset, which is the Reality Coprocessor, containing what is essentially the GPU, the north bridge, and the south bridge. Connected to the chipset is the main system memory, which were RAM bus based, which is a specific format like SDRAM and DDR. We also have peripherals, which included the audio video synthesis chips, as well as the controllers. And finally, there is the disk media equivalent, which in this case was a cartridge. Interestingly, the operating system provided by Nintendo was always included in some form on the cartridge, so in essence, they were like removable hard drives. The CPU and the RCP were connected via the system bus and the other components were all connected to the RCP. Notice how you can see the interconnects on the motherboard, most of which being parallel. Hopefully you can see that this layout resembles the previous diagram. The other consoles are somewhat similar, however, they are usually quite a bit more complicated, using many more components. Furthermore, this architectural way of looking at the system provides a good place to start when thinking about emulation. We effectively have the CPU, the chipset, and the peripherals. Ideally, the goal would be to build the emulator so that the processor is effectively a standalone unit. This would allow you to replace the chipset and the peripheral to build a new system. For example, consider the goal of running Linux or DOS. It would be almost impossible to run Linux on an N64 due to the quirks in the hardware and the BIOS, but Linux can run on the VR4300 CPU. So, ideally, you would want to create the emulator in such a way that by only modifying a single line of code, you are able to swap the RCP and peripherals out and replace them with something that better resembles a PC. Such a goal is easily possible as a result of the abstraction provided by the system bus. To better understand the abstraction provided by the system bus interface, let's consider the example of the NXP IMX6 ARM system on chip. This example was chosen due to the fact that it is more similar to a standard PC than a console, and a console example may have seemed a bit contrived. This device can come in up to four cores with a built-in OpenGL ES 2.0 compatible GPU, Ethernet, USB, SATA, and PCI Express, all of which are memory mapped to the system bus interface. What this means is that the devices can be accessed and controlled by simply writing to or reading from their assigned memory mapped locations. As far as the CPU is concerned, you are accessing the system memory and not a device. In fact, the only addresses which need to be allocated to specific resources are the exception vectors, which start at address 0 for the Cortex-A9. These are the addresses where the processor looks for code to execute when the CPU is first turned on or reset, as well as other types of exceptions. This is why the boot ROM starts at address 0. Note that the exception vector can be relocated out of the boot ROM at runtime. To push this example further, consider the case of trying to find out if there is a SATA device connected to the SATA port on the IMX6. To do this, we want to go to the SATA physical status register at address 0x220 
0, 1, 2, 8. Here we can look at either the interface power management or current interface speed fields, where we expect the value to be non-zero if the device is present. This can be done with the following C code. And that's it. It's as simple as reading from an address, and the CPU doesn't know and doesn't need to know that the address corresponds to the SATA port. While this example may seem a bit contrived, the same principles apply to reading from and writing to the disk, although the process is a bit more complicated. In the end, though, it boils down to writing to a memory mapped address. Hopefully now the usefulness and the simplicity of the abstraction provided by the system bus interface model is apparent. As a result, as long as the processor attached to the system bus can execute the code provided to it, the actual implementation of the processor is irrelevant. With that said, we can now look at the more specialized hardware on these consoles, the media processors, which deal with 3D graphics and audio. To start off with, let's consider a simple 3D scene and how computers, and by extension game consoles, render 3D geometry. Consider this simple scene with three spheres sitting on a plane. Each sphere has an associated scale, rotation, and position in 3D space. Additionally, we have a camera somewhere located in 3D space which is used to view the scene. The rendered image will then be sent to a monitor or TV screen, and when multiple 2D rendered images are played one after another, the illusion of animation is created. We can effectively look at rendering a single frame since animations are composed of several still frames one after another. Let's take the red sphere as an example, which can be represented as many triangles. All 3D objects rendered on a computer are, at their base level, composed of triangles. This is because a triangle is the simplest 2D shape which defines a plane. With that said, let's look at one of the triangles on the surface of the sphere. Here, the triangle is composed of three points, or vertices, each of which are located in 3D space, given by the coordinates x, y, and z. Each of these vertex positions can be represented by a vector, which is a mathematical object containing the set of three components. Typically, the positions are taken relative to some local origin of the model. For a sphere, this may be the center or the bottom of the sphere. We can actually reduce the problem to projecting the vertices onto the 2D image plane or near clip plane and reconnecting them in 2D space. This can be done via a matrix transform. First, we take the vertex vector, which is then multiplied by three specific matrices. The first one is the model matrix, which represents the object's location in space, its rotation, and its scale. If you wanted to animate an object moving across the screen, this would be the part you would change to create the animation. Next, we have the view matrix, which represents the camera's location and rotation in space. If you wanted to animate the camera panning, this is the part you would change. Finally, we have the projection matrix, which represents the projection of what the camera sees onto the 2D near clip plane. This matrix would contain things like the camera's field of view. If you wanted to animate a camera zooming, this is the part you would change. After this multiplication is done, we are left with the screen vector, which contains the X and Y coordinate of where the vertex was projected onto the near clip plane. This vector also contains the z-depth information, which helps make sure triangles closer to the camera are drawn on top of ones further away. Now that the vertices have been projected into 2D space, we can finally draw the triangle through a process known as rasterization. Here the graphics processor will scan across the screen pixel by pixel and fill in the relevant colors for the current triangle being drawn. And with that, we can do the same thing for all of the other triangles on the sphere, as well as the other spheres, and finish rendering the scene. This final step is called color blending or color adding. All of the steps from transforming the triangles to rasterizing them to compositing the final scene through color blending are all jobs that the modern graphics processing unit or GPU perform. Hopefully it is apparent that many vertices and therefore many triangles can be drawn at once. Additionally, multiple pixels can be checked for rasterization at once. These two tasks allow modern GPUs to run in parallel, allowing them to render many triangles in a single frame. Finally, the last part to consider is that the vector transformations require the multiplication of multiple different values at once, something that is often done through single instruction multiple data, or SIMD computing. Another term for this is vector processing. This will be a fairly quick overview compared to the previous slide. I should state that I'm not as familiar with the audio of these consoles, however, I feel that it is necessary to briefly talk about how resources are allocated to audio processing on each console. On the 5th and 6th generation consoles, there are two main ways audio was accomplished. Those were MIDI and CD samples. Most of the consoles could do both. However, the N64 could only do MIDI. However, the game developers provided the sample sounds used by MIDI. This meant that CD audio quality could effectively be accomplished by swapping audio samples in and out of memory. Though in practice, I do not believe any games did this. 
To start off with, let's cover MIDI. MIDI is the format which specifies which note to play and when to play them. In addition to time and pitch information, the intensity or volume of the note can also be specified. MIDI devices were broken down into channels where each channel had its own voice, where a voice could only play one note at a time. In the above example, six voices would be needed to play the notes on screen. In older consoles, such as the Nintendo Entertainment System, the voices were set to a simple waveform type. For example, square, triangle, or sine, which is where the classic 8-bit audio sound comes from. The other type of audio supported was CD sound samples. Here, the actual recorded waveform is stored in memory and streamed to the speakers. All of the systems that supported CD samples also allowed for multiple voices or sound sources. This meant that multiple CD samples could be played at the same time. An example of this would be firing a weapon while running and background music is playing. That would require three different sound samples to be played at the same time. This leads into the next problem. Since we have multiple channels or voices, they need to be combined somehow into a single audio stream. This is usually done by summing the waveform contributions either digitally or in analog hardware. And finally, these sounds are often associated with 3D objects in the game world. This means that we need to have a way to attenuate the volume and skew the audio pitch to give the perception of the sound source moving. An example of this would be an emergency vehicle driving by the player, where the sound of the siren both exhibits the Doppler effect and attenuation with distance away from the player. Combining multiple audio samples playing at once, as well as doing the 3D attenuation and pitch skewing are parallel jobs which lend themselves well for specialized hardware or vector processors. With both 3D graphics and audio basics covered, let's see how the 5th and 6th generation consoles handled their media processing. The two 5th generation consoles that are being considered are the Nintendo 64 and the original PlayStation. The N64 was designed with the media processor in the chipset, which significantly reduced the onboard chip number. On the other hand, the PlayStation split up its media processing components into multiple chips and an on-chip coprocessor. In both cases, the actual graphics rendering was done through a fixed function pipeline. To begin with, Let's look at how each console handled their 3D graphics in detail. The N64 used a vector signal processor called the Reality Signal Processor to do all of the vector and matrix transformations. Here, a vector processor consisted of eight 16-bit integer units, which used a single instruction multiple data architecture. The resulting operations produced 2D position data, which were then sent to the Reality Display Processor, which handled the rasterization of elements to be drawn on the screen. Note that here, the Reality coprocessors are on a completely separate chip from the CPU, and the only interaction with the CPU is via the system bus. The process for how the Reality coprocessor did this will be covered in a future video. Similarly, the PlayStation had a vector coprocessor attached to the main CPU, called the Geometry Transformation Engine. Here, the term vector processor is used loosely since the Geometry Transformation Engine only uses a strange 16-bit integer pipeline which could either perform an operation on a 2-coordinate 32-bit vector or a 3-coordinate 48-bit vector. Additionally, the GTE coprocessor executed coprocessor instructions directly from the CPU. This means that if a transformation was being done, the CPU would effectively need to stop executing other tasks so that it could devote cycles to the GTE. Note that the CPU could issue an instruction to the GTE and then continue with the CPU instruction the following cycle while it waited for the GTE instruction to finish. A final note about the GTE is that the GTE did not share registers with the CPU. This means that to load data into and out of the GTE, extra instructions and therefore CPU cycles would be needed. Once the relevant transformations were done in the GTE, the resulting 2D data was then sent over the system bus to the GPU, which provided the rasterization functionality. Notice that in both cases, the actual display unit or what would have been considered the GPU at the time, was only capable of drawing 2D objects. This would be done through commands such as draw 2D solid triangle or draw textured 2D triangle. Finally, a brief mention on how both consoles dealt with the audio. The PlayStation had a dedicated audio unit called the Sound Processing Unit, which was capable of doing both MIDI and CD sampling sounds. It had the ability to have 24 unique sounds, any of which could be either a CD sound sample, for example a recording of a piano key, a CD stream sound sample, for example from an audio CD, or simply noise generated from a random number generator. The SPU had built-in left-right attenuation as well as pitch transformation for the MIDI sounds. 
This was all accomplished digitally and was summed in the end via custom hardware. The N64, on the other hand, did not have dedicated sound hardware. Instead, the N64 shared the reality signal processor with both audio and display tasks. This means that the audio processing needed to be scheduled between the graphical transformations. For simplicity, the N64 only allowed for MIDI sounds. However, the sounds were from CD samples, making it possible to effectively stream CD audio by constantly loading samples into memory. As far as I'm aware though, this was the only limitation provided by the software development kit provided by Nintendo, and a custom CD streaming sound source could have been implemented in assembly. While the downside to this method is that the RSP resources needed to be shared, the upside is that there was no limit to the number of simultaneous sounds or voices besides that of the processing time and the system memory. I am calling the PlayStation 2 a fifth and a half generation console because it is more like the fifth generation consoles than the sixth generation ones, even though the time frame between release, at least in North America and Japan, was a year. The PS2 is sort of a hybrid between the PS1 and the N64. It has some dedicated hardware as well as connecting to an on-chip processor. To start off with, the PS2 no longer has a geometry transformation engine attached to the CPU, shown as the Emotion Engine or EE Core here. Instead, it has a tightly coupled vector processing unit called VU0. Here, the VU0 allows the CPU to access the VU0 registers, but it is not responsible for issuing instructions to VU0. Instead, both vector units, VU0 and VU1, have their own instruction memory, which is populated via DMA commands. The same is done on the N64's Reality Signal processor, having its own instruction memory, which is populated via DMA commands. Each vector unit contains a single integer core, as well as four single instruction, multiple data, 32-bit floating point cores. This allows for the vector units to multiply two vectors together in a single operation. Once again, the vector units are responsible for doing the 3D to 2D transformations, and the 2D data is sent to an external graphic synthesizer, or rasterizer. Interestingly, the PS2 does have a dedicated 2D graphics system called the Image Processing Unit, which can draw 2D images and sprites directly to the graphics synthesizer. Finally, the PS2 has a dedicated audio processor called the Sound Processing Unit 2. Unlike the original PlayStation, the Sound Processing Unit is not directly accessible by the CPU and needs to be set via DMA commands through the I.O. processor. Here, the SPU2 is almost identical to the original PlayStation sound processing unit. However, instead of 24 unique voices, the SPU2 is capable of 48 unique voices. Once again, each voice can either be a CD sample or noise played via MIDI, or can be streamed audio CD samples. Presumably, additional audio processing could be done in the vector units, like with the N64. However, it is unclear as to whether or not the PS2 supports this functionality. And finally, we have the sixth generation consoles the Nintendo GameCube, and the Microsoft Xbox. I should start off by mentioning that the information available on these two consoles is very limited, which is most likely due to strict NDAs that both companies had. First thing to note is that both consoles had dedicated GPUs in their north bridges. Additionally, both have a DSP-based audio processor, with the Xbox having the audio processor in the south bridge. I am uncertain as to whether or not these systems supported MIDI audio, perhaps they do via emulation. However, both support CD sound samples, and both allowed for up to 64 simultaneous channels. More interesting, though, is the more modern GPUs used by each system, neither of which being fixed function. Here we have the GameCube GPU, which is based on the ATI R300 series, and the Xbox GPU, which is an NVIDIA NV2A which is somewhere between the GeForce 3 and GeForce 4 series. The block diagram shown here for the NV2A is that of the GeForce 3, which seems to be more appropriate for comparison. The number of programmable processors is shown in each block diagram via colored squares. The blue squares represent vertex shader cores, with the GameCube having one and the Xbox having two. The pixel shaders are shown via purple squares, where each GPU has four. Both GPUs have various feature differences regarding number of textures accessible at once as well as the number of texture loaders for each pixel shader. These two were some of the very first programmable GPU models and as such they lack many features that modern GPUs have. To start off with, neither GPU uses a unified architecture which is the standard today. This is where the vertex shader and the pixel shaders run on the same compute units. Both shaders were programmed in an assembly-like microcode, where today OpenGL and DirectX shaders use a C-like language called GLSL or HLSL, respectively. 
Since these were very early programmable shader cores, neither offered the use of flow control. So this means that there were no branches, jumps, or function calls. Conditional execution could, however, be implemented using the set less than or set greater than equal instructions, which return a 1 if the condition is true and a 0 if it is false. This would mean using a multiply by 0 if you did not want to take the branch. Additionally, these cores did not provide functionality to evaluate trigonometric functions, but did allow for square roots, logs, and exponents. These cores exclusively used 32-bit floating point execution and were set up to deal with four vectors. This means that data paths were 128 bits wide. A four vector would be the coordinates x, y, z, and w, where w is often one. The reason for the fourth coordinate is that it makes the math much easier for the computer. Note that these units cannot handle integers since they only have floating point data paths. Additionally, since the data path is 128 bits, that means that if you only wanted to load a single float, you would have to load the 32-bit float followed by a 96-bit zero. And finally, these cores were all multi-threaded. That means that multiple threads of execution could be in flight at a given time. This is because certain operations require multiple cycles, so the cores can allocate work to another thread while the current one is waiting to finish. To wrap things up, let's look at the hardware comparison of the 5th and 6th generation consoles. First we have the original PlayStation, which used a MIPS R3000 processor. The R3000 processor was pipeline but lacked a floating point unit altogether, something which all of the other consoles had. It used a specialized geometry transformation engine coprocessor to do the 3D vector transformation, and a specialized fixed function pipeline for drawing the transformed graphics. Additionally, the PlayStation had a specialized hardware sound processing unit. The N64 followed two years later using a MIPS VR4300 processor, which was also pipelined. Unlike the R3000, however, this processor did have a floating point unit. The N64 had a secondary vector processor, which was used for both 3D transformations and sound processing. Similar to the PlayStation, the N64 used a fixed function pipeline for drawing the transformed graphics. The successor to the PlayStation was released six years later and marked the beginning of the sixth generation game consoles. From a hardware perspective, however, the PlayStation 2 had more in common with the fifth generation consoles than the sixth generation consoles that followed a year later. The main processor on the PS2 was a special ASIC designed specifically for the PS2 called the Emotion Engine, which had a MIPS superscalar core based off of the MIPS R5000 processor. The superscalar core had the ability to issue two 64-bit operations at once, or a single 128-bit operation. In addition to the main processor, the Emotion Engine also contained two individually programmable vector processors to do the 3D transformations, as well as a fixed function pipeline for drawing the transform geometry. For audio, the PS2 used specialized hardware similar to what the original PlayStation used, with some additional features added. And finally, we have the 6th generation consoles, both released in 2001, the Nintendo GameCube and the Microsoft Xbox. Both of these systems had out-of-order execution processors, programmable GPUs, and programmable digital signal processors for the audio. Overall, they both had similar features, mainly only differing by clock speed and instruction set architecture. Since x86 is a complex instruction set architecture, or CISC, and PowerPC is a reduced instruction set architecture, or RISC, it is likely that even with the increased clock speed of the Xbox CPU, they may have had similar performance. With the one exception being the weird cell architecture of the PlayStation 3, all consoles that followed used a similar architecture to the 6th generation consoles, which happens to be the standard PC architecture. On the note of hardware emulation, these consoles are listed on the order of easiest to most difficult to emulate, the original PlayStation being the easiest, and the Xbox being the most difficult. Even though the PlayStation is the easiest, the best place to begin emulating all of the consoles would be with the Nintendo 64. The reason for this being that the R3000 processor is effectively a stripped down R4300, and the R5000 processor is an R4300 processor with two execution paths. On that note, in the next video I will cover more details on the Nintendo 64 hardware architecture and how one might go about implementing the system in an FPGA. Thanks for watching.